Hey scholars, this is Professor Denham here. This is a lecture video for chapters four and five from our H common 100 uh, textbook on real communication. So make sure you're having the PowerPoint presentation open. You have both chapters four and five in the same PowerPoint document. So make sure you have that open and you're following along. I recommend as always to take notes in the PowerPoint presentation and or in the textbook itself or your notes or however it is that you take notes as you're listening to this. And as I mentioned in the um, in the module on Canvas that uh, you might consider playing this at a, a higher speed or higher playback speed. You could try it at 1.5 or 1.75 or 2.0 so that way. So that way you just play the video faster. Obviously I'd be talking a lot more quickly, but um, you should be able to still follow along, but do whatever works best for you. It's just one way to save time as you're uh, listening. So chapter four is on verbal communication. Um, I have two two themes for the for the chapter, and one is that words are powerful. Slide two: words are powerful, and you choose language. So it's not accidental when you, when when you say something to someone or someone says something to you. That's not an accident. It's a choice. So language is a choice. Sometimes you say things, and and then you might say like, "Oh my gosh, I didn't mean to say that." Well, maybe you didn't. Maybe you regret saying that, but the the point is you chose to say that. No one else is speaking for you. Whenever, whenever you say something, you, maybe you're saying it out of anger or out of frustration or out of anxiety or out of uh, excitement. But the point is like you, you are in control of your thoughts. There's other forces that influence our words, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, you are responsible for the things that you say because you're, the, the words coming out of your mouth. So that slide three, don't worry about knowing everything there, but the social construction of reality is a theory that helps us to understand the, the nature of, of how communication takes place. But basically that theory means that uh, humans construct symbols in order to have meaning. Symbols meaning letters and words, and when we put words together along with nonverbal communication with facial expressions and hand gestures, et cetera, it leads to shared meaning. And without shared meaning, it's, it's hard to have sort of, it's, it's hard to have any sort of in, uh, meaningful interaction with other people. Um, but the nature of language is, is inherently unclear. And, and in, in order for us to understand certain words, we have to understand those words through interaction with other people through, so that we have that shared meaning as, as you read through that definition of social construction of reality. So if you look at slide four, the term appetizing, well, the term appetizing might mean one thing to you and it means something else to me. So I look at those two photos on the left right there on slide four and I see you know, it's meat and hey, I like meat. And if and if you don't like meat or you think that looks gross, then you wouldn't say that's appetizing. It's appetizing to me, but not to you. Slide five, the the ones on the right, the that bottom right picture, maybe to you that looks appetizing. Maybe you're thinking, oh my gosh, that looks delicious. It's like a pizza, it's a hamburger, it's a burrito, it's a little bit of everything. That is so appetizing. And others, we look at that, and we think that's not appetizing. So appetizing is 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 the the term itself is understood in so far as um that the meaning that we've negotiated with someone else maybe maybe you you know you think that's appetizing and because you you've had that kind of food with other people and you've all agreed like this is appetizing but that doesn't carry over into all their all other cultures so the term appetizing or any specific term is understood insofar as the degree to which people have agreed on on things okay along that note um the authors talk about linguistic relativity so language reflects and shapes worldviews. Um, certain words are, are relative, that the meanings of certain words are relative to where, where, you, where you grew up, where you're from, etc. So if you're a multilingual speaker, if you speak more than one language, you might, um, you might be able to describe something in your native language that doesn't necessarily transfer over into, let's say, English, because this is, an, you know, of course, where we're speaking English. But you, maybe your maybe your native language or another language that you know is rooted in a culture in a, in a culture that's outside of of California, outside of the United States. So when I was in in Haiti, my wife and I visited Haiti several years ago, and I we were there with with some um, sort of like a church affiliation, but it was some people from our church and other people from different different things. We all went as a group. Some people focused on like development and uh, medical stuff, and my wife and I helped out in, in all the ways that we could. But one of the things that that I witnessed was um, they were building schools out there, and there were some some companies or some organizations from Louisiana that were when we lived there at the time. So these these organizations from Louisiana were going out to to Haiti, and they were building schools, and they were 
adding schools and um, developing the land and hiring teachers and getting curriculum and uniforms and all that kind of stuff, right? And all of that happened really quickly. And I would say, wow, that's a lot of progress. And I was talking to one of the, the, the lead guys there. And I said, that's, that's so, there's so much progress. And then, and then the translator was talking to the, the main teacher. He was like the person in charge of this particular um, uh, area, if you will. And they basically said, there's no word for progress in, in Haitian Creole, which, is, which was the, the primary language that they spoke there. And, and so we were all kind of like, what do you mean there's no word for progress? And, the, and he said, there's just not a word for progress. So the, the, the question is, how do you explain the concept of progress? Like, look at all these schools that you're developing, like that's progress. And he's kind of like, okay, I understand what you're, I hear what you're saying, but we don't have a word for progress. So how do you explain the concept of progress without using the word progress? Because there's not a word for progress in their language. So um, that's an example of linguistic relativity. It's not that progress didn't take place. It's just that what what we have viewed, what I viewed with their schools and all the development and all the the changes in in um, their lifestyle, I see that as the term progress because I understand the concept of progress. But it doesn't mean that progress hasn't taken place. It's just that the concept of progress is understood linguistically um, uh, to me in a different way than it is to him. It's not like it's not like progress can't take place just because they don't have a word for progress doesn't mean they can't experience progress, but they just have a different word for it. I didn't really know, you know, what it was if, if they had a word for it, you know, we could say that things were different. You look at you look at the what, how the land looked prior to, to them building the schools and then you look at it now and it's like you see schools and it's, it's different. But how you explain progress to someone who doesn't have the word for progress is a challenge. So along that, um, along those lines, we have all kinds of metaphors and expressions that you might know in one language, but it doesn't really carry out into other languages. So you might have heard, hey, it's raining cats and dogs. And we all get what that means. But if you try to translate that to other languages and other cultures, they might be like, wow, that's so confusing because it's it's just understood within a particular culture. In Louisiana, there's, there's a term called lanya. It's a little something special, a little something extra. It's just, it's just a term. It's an expression. It's a, it's a way of life. Um, or that expression, can't dance in the fields too wet to plow. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you haven't. Um, in other words, if there's not, we got nothing else going on, we might as well like, you know, bake something, you know, there, there's, we got nothing else to do. So we might as well, right. You can't dance in the fields too wet to plow. We're bored. We might as well do something else. And then I have on slide eight, we have, I have a, a short video and it's, um, it's illustrating uh, I think this is, is, is relevant to, to our culture, to Southern California culture, but there's all kinds of expressions that are, that are, uh, you'll see they're, they're said in Spanish and then they have a direct translation to English and it's supposed to be funny and I hope you don't find it offensive. It, it's not intended to be offensive. The, I believe the intention of this video, at least my intention is to, to illustrate how when you, when you have an expression understood in one particular language, it doesn't really carry over the same way when you translate it to another language. It just doesn't, it doesn't sound right. And then in this video, it makes it, it makes it sound funny and, and kind of humorous, but this is something I've done in the classroom before where I'll, I'll tell the students, Hey, what are some expressions that you have in your native language? If you speak another language, um, or even, even if you speak, you know, two or three languages, what's it, what's an expression that you know of in another language? And, and then had, what, what, what's the direct translation into English? And then, and then what does it actually mean? So when I do this in the classroom, it's pretty fun because we get all kinds of different um, expressions from different, different cultures and different languages. So watch this, I hope you enjoy it. Watch this video and then um, try, to, try to write down some ideas, write, write down what, what would be an expression that you know of, whether it's English or another language, like what's the expression but especially if, if you know a language, I mean, if you know an expression in another language, what is that? And then how does it translate into English? And then how would you explain that? How would you explain that expression in English using, a, using context? So all this linguistic relativity is uh, related to what's called the Sap Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is the idea that human language and thought are, are highly interrelated. Some people would say our thoughts are controlled by language you can't conceive of something for which you have no word. So some people think that some scholars think, well, if we don't have a word for it, we can't conceive of it. So with that example, and, and, and I don't necessarily agree with that, but, but, but here's, here's how it relates to the example with when I was in Haiti. Um, the, 
the person I was talking to, they, they had no word for progress. So they, they weren't able to think that. They, he can't think of the, the word progress if they don't have a word for progress. But some people say you can't con conceive of something for which you have no word. And it's not as though he's un in he's not as though he's incapable of of conceptualizing the co like the concept of progress. It's just that there's no word for it, so it changes their their way of of thinking things. So imagine if there was no word for complaining. Imagine growing up in a culture or visiting a culture where they didn't have a word for complaining. What well, how would you describe complaining in, in a culture where there's no word for complaining? Certainly, there's things that people are going to do that would warrant a complaint. Maybe, you know, something bad happens. And, and instead of saying, uh, instead of like filing a complaint towards an organization, what would you do, right? If there's no word for complaint, for complaining in a culture, like what, what would take place to that word? Would, would behaviors exist that, 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 um, that typically would be understood as complaining? Would those behaviors cease to exist? Can you not conceive of the concept of complaining? It's an empirical question, but the point is, um, language is relative to a culture and, and words that we have in one culture don't always carry out, don't always have a direct translation to other cultures. I had a professor who, who was taking an emotion. Uh, she went to a seminar of learning about emotions and she said there was this culture that um, had a specific word for a, a specific kind of emotion or frustration that people get from peeling coconuts for several hours. Coconut, coconuts was part of, part of their, um, a big, a big source of income for this particular culture. And so a lot of people would have a job where they, they have to peel coconuts and they deal with coconuts for several hours a day. And, and they had a specific emotion tied to that experience. I forget what it was called, but the point is, I don't know what that's like. I've never experienced that specific emotion. I've never experienced that specific feeling of, of being in a culture where I'm peeling coconuts for several hours a day. But it doesn't mean that I can't, you know, I, I suppose if I went to that culture or if I went to, if I visited that area and I, and I tried to peel coconuts and do what they're doing for several hours, perhaps I would experience it. But just because I don't have a word for it in my own language doesn't mean I can't experience it. But our thoughts, nevertheless, our thoughts are still highly influenced, not necessarily completely controlled, but our thoughts are highly influenced by the language that we currently have. You learn new language, you go to new cultures, you knew, you, you, have new experiences, it changes the way you think. It gives you more access. It gives your 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 cog it gives your brain and your thoughts more access to more words to experience to, to label more experiences. Point is, it's relative, right? Language is relative. Um. So on to slide ten. Bottom line, uh, na uh, the nature of language. Language is a system of symbols structured by grammar, controlled by syntax, common to a community of people. So that's like the the more like um you know the, the black and white of of language symbols are, are letters and you put them together in certain ways and they create words and words have to be assembled in certain ways to use proper grammar and proper syntax so that way we have understanding that way we can can speak fluently to one another and have that shared understanding Lang uh, languages have several functions you can uh, on slide 11 they're used for controlling things, for informing others, for sharing information, for feeling, for imagining, for being creative, for ritualizing. So we, we, we use language for all kinds of things. So a lot of this information hopefully is, is somewhat like familiar to you. You've been, you've been speaking, you've been using language from the time that you were born. So now you're understanding the labels that are attached to what you've been doing, you know, the majority of your life. People use words as symbols. So there's a term called bypassing is when the, the meanings to, to words don't correspond. So the same words can mean different things to different people. So what it means to be on time, some people say on time is, is five minutes early, uh, on time is late, and then five minutes late is you know really bad or something like that. Um, so what does it mean to be on time for work? What does it mean to be on time to a party? What does it mean to be on time for, let's say, sports practice? So I know that my, uh, my father-in-law was a baseball coach and, and I guess the rule of thumb was if, if, you're, if the practice starts at three o'clock, you need to be there by 2.55. And if you're there at three o'clock, then that's late, right? And if you're there at 3.05, then it's not that you're late, it's that you're gonna get in trouble, right? Or that you're gonna, there's gonna be a consequence to, to serve. Um, or the term sick, you know, that can mean a lot of different things. The term sick can mean that you're, you're physically sick, that like your body is not doing well, or sick can mean a positive thing, like, hey, those, shoe, oh, those shoes are so sick, right? Um, and what it means to be polite, 
what, what the word good. There's all there. There's some, there's several words that that I understand to mean one thing, and you understand it to mean another thing. So it's bypassing. So the when my meaning is different than your meaning, it's bypassing. It's the same word. And it, the, the, the meanings might be similar or they might be completely different. But the way you understand that is within the context in which it's spoken. The authors talk about two different levels of meaning with words. You have the denotative level and the connotative level. Pretty straightforward. De think of denotative as dictionary definition and connotative is um, is the, the, any sort of emotion uh, or feelings that are tied to the word. So the connotative level of meaning for the word car might be different for you. If you're a car enthusiast and for you, you, you love cars, you go to car shows and, and you know you work on cars and you think about cars a lot. Well, a car for you is different than let's say a car for someone who just, when I think car, I think it's just a vehicle that gets me from point A to point B. It's not that one definition is better than others. It's just that there's, it's important to know there's different levels of meaning for different types of words, denotative and connotative. Um, and then there's, of course, problematic uses of language on the slide 14. Hurtful messages are inherently bad, right? If it's a hurtful message, it's hurtful. If I'm saying something and it's hurting you, then that's something that should catch my attention. And I need to be more mindful about the way I use language. Labeling, if we just if we use words to label people and put people in boxes, that can be problematic. Uh, bias language and then profanity, civility, if, if using profanity. Profanity is part of the American vernacular. So profanity profanity words are not inherently good or bad, but if I'm using profanity and then it's offending you or it's causing you anxiety, then that's a problematic use of, of, the, of my language, of my profanity use, depending on the context, right? If, if we're, um, you know, at, at a place of work or we're a place of business and, and if the, the norm is that you use proper language and that you shouldn't use profanity, then my use of profanity is, is problematic, right? If, if we're not in that context or the situation where profanity would be bad, then, then it's different. So it's important to be mindful of the language you're using and how that impacts other people. And specifically, especially considering the context in which you're using it. So words are powerful. They have the, the power to create and label experiences to, to affect our thoughts and actions, to reflect culture, to make and break relationships. Um, that's how you initiate a, that's the way that you initiate a relationship is through words. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Nice to meet you. Right. The way you break your relationship should be through words and not through just ghosting, but uh, we'll talk about ghosting in another chapter. The way you would end a relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship, a friendship, let's say a business relationship, a, like customer employee relationship, you use words, hey, you're, you're, we're no longer going to use you as our supplier for this product, right? So how do you use words appropriately and competently, let's say beyond romantic relationship or beyond friendships when you're in, in, in a professional setting? Um, you, the point is you use words to break those relationships. Um, and then of course you have uh, trigger words, supportive communication, empathy words, and are, are, are highly related to the way that we establish supportive relationships. We can use words to, to, to foster supportive communication, to, to create empathy, um, using words to, to make someone, um, think that you're feeling what they're feeling whether it's empathy or sympathy. Sympathy is basically saying, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. And empathy is, I, I'm i sorry for what you're going through because I've been there before. So it's important to be mindful of saying something like, I know what you're going through because I've been there before versus I'm just so sorry. Um, so be, be mindful of saying, I can empathize with you. If you can't empathize with someone, then don't, then don't say, I can empathize with you unless you've actually been in their shoes before, so to speak. Okay. Um, on to nonverbal communication. So I'm going down quickly and I'm not, of course, I'm not covering everything. So nonverbal communication, what is it? Uh, slide 19. It's communication without words. It's messages expressed by non non-linguistic means. Communication other than written or spoken language that creates meaning or has the potential to create meaning. We talked about this example before where I said, if I'm walking by someone and I wink at that person, is that is that communication? Well, it depends. If if I just had something in my eye, if, if there was if it was windy and, and you know a piece of dust got in my eye and I winked, and that's why I winked. Well, that's not really communication. It's a behavior, it's an automatic response that my eyelid made because of something going in my eye. But um, when we're talking about nonverbal communication and the concept of winking, well, winking would mean like I'm trying to I'm trying to actually communicate some sort of message. 
whether I'm trying to say hello, whether it's just like, you know, some people still wink. It used to be a lot more common where people would wink at each other as a, as a sign of like, let's say support or as a way to say hello. But nowadays it would, be, it, it would probably be more understood in terms of a romantic gesture. But the point is nonverbal communication is, is um, messages expressed by non-linguistic means. There's still a large emphasis on verbal communication, an emphasis on words in terms of how we understand nonverbal communication. So let's say tone of voice and whatnot. Well, tone of voice and, and, and the, the nature of language, when we're understanding that within nonverbal communication, we're, we're looking at the nonverbal components of language. So the nonverbal components of our words are under the category of nonverbal communication. So I have a video here on um, on slide 20 and I and I have I just say nonverbal communication is very ambiguous. It's very it's, it's oftentimes difficult to know what someone means. And so the way that you give meaning to your nonverbal mes nonverbal messages <clears throat> is through facial expressions and by by using words to explain things along with facial expressions. So I have this video from a uh, this woman who lives in, at, at one point she did, I don't know if she still does it. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure she does. I, I don't know her name, but she has a YouTube channel called, um, uh, may you something may you, I forget, but, but basically what she does, she's, she's an American teacher in China. So she teaches English to, um, people in China who are acquiring the English language. But what she does is she has this YouTube channel where she'll have phrases and expressions that are American phrases, American expressions, and she will do her best. She's extremely animated, like one of the most animated, energetic speakers I've ever seen in my life. So she uses facial expressions and, and nonverbal communication to explain and contextualize American expressions. So she says it in English using facial expressions and hand gestures and nonverbal communication. And then she translates that into, uh, I believe it's Mandarin. And, and she does her best job of, of trying to explain like an American expression using English and then, and then contextualizing that in uh, Mandarin, but also using all kinds of nonverbal behaviors to, 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 um, to give it life, to, so to create that aha, like, oh, okay, I, I get what you're saying. Right, because if, if I'm if I'm one of her students and my native language is Mandarin and I don't really know much about English and I don't know much about American expressions, like I can I, I can understand I have a better understanding of what you're saying because of the nonverbal uh, expressions. But the the point is it's very ambiguous. There's not one correct way to to communicate a message uh, with her the different expressions that she uses. But feel free to watch her page. It's pretty interesting, pretty uh, animated. But anyhow, it's ambiguous. Pages 108 through 113 talk about the different functions. So what's the function of a number of nonverbal communication? One main function is that it, it helps to manage interaction. It helps to manage and regulate my interaction um, with other people, right? They, the different nonverbal behaviors that I use, whether I'm conscious or, uh, or subconscious, whether it's a conscious decision or a subconscious decision, it helps to regulate conversation. So sometimes I use nonverbal communication to reinforce things like, like good job, right? Um, or substitute instead of saying good job, I might just do this, right? Or contradicting, if I say good job, right? I mean, I'm using the same example or deceiving. Um, we oftentimes use nonverbal behaviors to deceive someone, right? When I know the truth of the matter of something, and I'm just using nonverbal behaviors to try to deceive you, uh, you you primarily rely on my nonverbal behaviors, and and so that's why it's easy to lie to people. So if you look at um, slide 22, I have a, a, a brief video from uh, ABC7. It's an older video and you hear a, you'll see a, a professor who focuses, who, who does a lot of work in deception, deception detection and whatnot, deception, um, uh, de deceiving others and how to, how to detect deception among other people. He talks a lot about, um, paying attention to micro expressions of people's facial expressions as a way to determine whether or not someone's telling the truth. And he does a pretty good job of, of explaining that. But the, the bottom line is the only way we know if someone's telling a lie or a truth is if we know the answer, right? If the only way we know if someone's lying is if we know the truth. So there's this concept called Othello error. And Othello error is this idea that if, if people suspected me of committing a crime, maybe you, maybe I'm on the witness stand, or I mean, I'm on, I'm on trial, right? 
and I'm being questioned by the attorneys and I know I didn't do anything wrong or, or I'm in an interrogation room and I have different maybe detectives or law enforcement officials are coming in and ask me all these questions about, hey, where were you on the night of December 10th? And, and I'm so nervous because I didn't do it. And I know what's at stake. Like I could get arrested. I could go to prison. I could pay fines. I could, do all, I could, I could have all these bad things happen to me. And I'm so nervous. And so as a result of this nervousness, I'm maybe I'm sweating. My hands are shaking. My face is, is uh, turning red. My, my um, I think I said it before, my, my, I might have a shaky voice. Uh, my, my knees are tapping. I'm doing, I might mess up my story. I, I keep contradicting myself. Like, no, that's not what happened. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. And so um, everyone else might be looking at me thinking, you see, he's totally lying. Look at all these signs of deception. His voice is shaky, his, he's sweating, his face is turning red. Um, he's moving all over the place. He can't get his story straight. So the Othello error is this idea that, that um, uh, people would mistake, would, would mistake nervous behaviors as signs of deception. And the, and the question is, like, I might be the only person who knows that I'm innocent. Everyone else thinks I'm guilty. So how do I convince them? I'm, I'm trying to be honest, but I'm so nervous. And they, they're, they're mistaking my signs of nervousness as signs of deception. So that's Othello error. Um, bottom line is it's easy to, to tell a lie. Because if, if I know that what people are looking for is that I'm calm, that I have my story straight, I can memorize that. I can rehearse that. It's basically acting, right? So what, what some people are looking for is like, look, he's calm. He's got a story straight. The attorney said, where were you on the night of December 10th? And he, he told his story really well. It's not a bad thing to do that. But, but if that's what people are looking for as, as a sign of truth telling, then it's easy to, to basically act that way. So that's one, one of the, the complicated notions of deception, specifically deception detection. And another function of nonverbal communication is creating immediacy. And immediacy is um, one of those things that it, the, the, the more, the more immediacy that I feel with another person, the more close I feel with that person. So immediacy is something that, that decreases psychological distance. So when I meet someone for the first time, if, if, if I, if I'm talking to someone we're, and we're strangers or I'm talking to someone and there's, you know, we don't know much, much about each other, or maybe, maybe I, I know someone really well, but maybe we've been in a fight lately. Maybe there's been tension between us. So I'm sitting down with that person again, right? I'm sitting down with a person. I know them well. I don't know them well. But the point is there might be a great amount of psychological distance. I feel distant from that person psychologically, right? Psychologically, I feel very distant. And that might be an uncomfortable feeling. So the question is, how do I, how do I close that gap? How do I, how do I reduce that psychological distance to, to create a feeling of closeness? And the answer is we do that through, um, exhibiting immediacy cues. So look at slide 24 and there's all these immediacy cues. They're all, it's all based on nonverbal components, proximity, body orientation, eye contact, gestures, posture, touch, voice, facial expression. So when I'm doing these things, when I'm practicing, th practicing these things, like a close forward lean, direct body orientation. So, so how I am, like if I'm, if I'm sitting like this to you, like this, having a conversation versus like this, um, my my distance is the same, but my body orientation is different. It's more direct and I'm looking at you more. And then mutual eye behavior, smiling, positive facial expressions, head nods, your your you know, your head nod moving, open and relaxed arms. Instead of instead of doing this, you're just, you know, you're more open arm. Appropriate touch, you know, if if, if you're in, interacting with someone. You might say every once in a while, you might have a light touch on the arm or light touch on the shoulder, depending on who, who you're talking to, you might hold their hand. You change your voice, a higher pitch, an upward pitch, or, or you lower your voice. There's a variety of things that you can do. The point is you, there's a variety of things that you can do non-verbally to close that, dis, the, close that gap, that psychological distance. So as to create a more, uh, a greater feeling of warmth and closeness. So that's what, that's one of the functions of nonverbal communication specifically for immediacy. So <clears throat> the question is, how do you, how can you use immediacy cues to, um, for practical purposes, like to determine if a person is interested to have a conversation with you, slide 25. 
to communicate to babies their love, to do well on the job interview, to increase the likelihood of selling something. So these are very practical applications of nonverbal communication, specifically immediacy. So sometimes you might be engaging in small talk. Maybe you're at a networking event and you're trying to meet people in your business, trying to grow your business. And here's the thing, not everyone wants to talk to you. So how do you, how do you, how can you determine if a person wants to have a conversation with you? Romantic, non-romantic, business, non-business. Um, the way you determine it is by looking at these non-verbal, uh, these immediacy cues. If people are, are inching away from you, they're like, oh, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Very interesting. They're literally inching and, and they're moving their body away. They're not smiling. Right. That might be a sign that they don't want to talk to you. Right. Um, and, and the way that you communicate the babies that they're loved, an infant, a, a baby that's just a month old, right? They, they don't know what you're saying, but they do know what you're saying, not verbally. If I just said, I love you, baby, please stop, uh, stop crying when I'm trying to change your diaper. That's not going to work. How do I know? Because I have two kids and that didn't work. Um, and what I found was sometimes I have, I have a tendency to have like a more, uh, a more stern face, or I might look stoic. I might look, oftentimes I might look, look upset and I'm not upset. That's just sometimes the look I have on my face. So one of the things that I found is when I would be changing my, my kids' diapers, sometimes they'd be, or whether I'm changing the diapers or I'm just spending time with them, sometimes they would just lose it. They would just start crying. And it doesn't do any good for me to try to talk to them. Like, um, uh, Hey, do you think you could stop crying? Or if I give you something, could you stop crying? No, I, I, I lower my voice. I smile, I use positive facial expressions. I, I would make myself look like an absolute idiot in my, re, in, in my opinion, but the thing is it worked like a miracle, right? Babies need that, humans need that. We need that, that feeling of warmth, that feeling of psychological closeness. When, when I'm a baby and, and I'm my, I feel like my world's out of control, I need my primary caregiver, my mom, my dad, or the person who's with me to be practicing these immediacy cues. And if you've been, if you've been around babies enough, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And of course, how to do well on a job interview. You're literally doing all of these things on a job interview, right? You're, you're trying to, you're trying to create as much psychological closeness as possible. So if you've ever, if you've ever had a job interview, maybe it lasted for 30, 45 minutes and the whole time you were like, posture was good. You're so aware of your voice and, and everything you were doing and saying your facial expressions and your voice. After that 30, 45 minute interview, you might be exhausted. You're, you're like absolutely drained because this is work, right? To, to practice these immediacy cues, it's a lot of work, um, but it but it does work. The work pays off. And of, and of course, along the same lines of a job interview, increasing the likelihood of selling something, how do you, how do, you do good at sales? Um, verbal communication obviously is, is key to, to selling something, knowing what to say and when to say it and how to say it, but the how to say it is based on the, the immediacy cues, but also all these other nonverbal components have a, uh, a giant impact, a very significant impact on, on making something more, um, appealing to buy. So, <clears throat> uh, more on the functions of nonverbal communication. Is social influence. Uh, there's lots of research so on the slides 26 and 27. There's lots of research on the association between touch and compliance gaining. When it comes to touch and proxemics, they engage our senses very, very powerfully. So proxemics meaning when you're really close to someone. Think of our five senses: our you know sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. Um, the closer you are to someone, the more that you see everything. Right? You you see a person more clearly. You can smell them. You're you can actually feel their body warmth body warmth. Sometimes you can smell their clothes, their hair, their makeup. There's all kinds of things that can really engage our senses powerfully. And that can go well, right? If you have too much fragrance on or you smell bad, like if you, if you haven't taken a shower and you don't smell good and you're trying to, you're trying to influence someone in a positive way, that might backfire on you, right? If you don't, if, if, if you smell inappropriate, right? Or if, if you have too much cologne or not enough cologne or whatever. Um, uh, or, um, yeah, the point is there's a lots of research on the association between touch and compliance gaining. The, the use of touch in, 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 in several instances, the, the slight use of touch with, with, with certain people has systematically increased the likelihood of, of a request, of, of someone complying with a request. Sounds weird, right? You think, well, if someone touched me, I, maybe, I, maybe that would backfire. 
but the people in these surveys, the people who have done these experiments, they're 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 trained how to touch someone, and usually the touch is somewhere between the shoulder, somewhere between the shoulder and then like the wrist. So it's it's an innocuous place on the body to touch someone, especially if it's a stranger, and they're trained how to touch them in a way such that oftentimes the people aren't even aware that they're being touched. So one way that it was done is, uh, hey, would you mind taking the survey? There's people who would ask to go to a mall, a public place, and they would, you know, they'd have the control group where they would just ask 200 people, hey, would you mind taking the survey? It'll take you five minutes. And then how many people respond? How many people comply with that request? Maybe, maybe half, maybe 40%. And then in the experimental group, they said, hey, would you mind taking the survey? It'll take you five minutes. But in the experimental group, the researcher, the person doing the survey would lightly touch the person somewhere somewhere between like the wrist and the shoulder, a light innocuous touch, right? Um, in a way that was not intrusive at all. And in many cases, the people were not even aware that they were, they were not even aware that they were being touched. On the back of the survey it said, before I asked you to take the survey, I lightly touched you on the arm, were you aware of it? And a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, no, I wasn't at all. Um, so in that in that experiment or in that condition, the people were a lot more likely to, t to uh, complete the survey. So the question is why? Why are people more likely to comply with their requests when they're when they're lightly touched somewhere on their arm? Um, there was a survey where they the, someone asked to, to watch my dog. They said, "Hey, could you watch my dog while I go across the street and pick up my my prescription medication?" It's a very bizarre request. This was this one was done in France. So they said, "Hey, you know, they had the experimental group light light touch on their arm. Would you mind watching my dog for a few minutes while I go across the street?" And then the other group, there was no touch. And the touch condition they had a higher compliance rate. Uh, getting a free ride on a bus, same kind of thing. A light touch on the bus driver's arm versus no touch. And then also, thank you for dining with us. That one was, um, there's been a few studies where they had food servers, bartenders, uh, cocktail servers and whatnot, just before dropping the bill, just just before giving the person the bill, they would lightly touch them on their arm and they would say like, oh, I'll take the, I'll, I'll take the check when you're ready. Um, and that's that's a lot more common. I worked in restaurants for several years, and it, it was not uncommon if I if I brought my if I, when I brought the bill to someone, I would just give them a really light touch on the arm, like oh, I'll take this for when you're ready. And in those conditions, and the people in the conditions where people were touched, lightly touched, the tip average went up. So people got more tips. Um, the servers got a higher tip amount when when they were like lightly touching people on the arm. So this is all pre-COVID, by the way. So I don't know that this would also, I don't know that they would, you would have the same effects with what's going on, what's, with what's been going on in our world lately. But the point is, touch is powerful. Nonverbal communication is powerful. Um, and that's just one particular code of, of nonverbal communication. So on to proxemics. Proxemics deal with the way that we derive meaning based on how we relate to space. So we all organize our, our bedrooms a certain way, our offices a certain way. Um, the way that you relate to, to, to space, you know, when, when you're sitting in a movie theater, is this, is this my armrest or is that your armrest? Uh, when you go into a classroom, you always sit in this, you, you generally sit in the same, um, chair or desk. And oftentimes you, you have, you have, you have the sense of ownership over where you're sitting, even though it's just, it's temporary ownership, but you still have a sense of ownership. And then we have, um, uh, the, the zones of space. We have Edwin T. Hall's zone, four zones of space. We have intimate, personal, social, and public. So every zone of space is sort of determined by the context. So intimate space versus personal versus social, like my intimate space, um, if I'm talking to someone and they're in that, like, you know, within a couple inches of me versus a foot and a half away, well, that might, I might consider that intimate if, if it's just me and another person and there's no one else around, like me and my wife, and we're, we're just sitting talking and there's no one else around. But if I'm, a, if I'm in a crowded room or if I'm in a crowded elevator, and I'm talking to someone who's a few inches away. I don't think of that as intimate space, even though it's technically it falls under the category of intimate. Um, but these are the different zones of space and how we relate to space. These these are how most people think about space and how it makes them feel, basically. And then we have close talkers. So when people get into that intimate space, so we we all have a certain sense of our of our uh, spatial bubble, right? when you're invading my space. And maybe that's six inches, maybe that's a foot, maybe that's 18 inches, maybe that's two feet. It's different for everyone, but it's also highly influenced by the context. So um, if you watch that, there's a, a brief clip from from Seinfeld on close talkers. Basically, I want you to watch this and um, try to have fun with it. But the question is, how, how do you respond to close, 
to close talkers. If you, I'm sure some of you have, have responded to close talkers, you, you've interacted with people who are close talkers. Maybe you yourself are, are a close talker. And it's not that being a close talker is an inherently good or bad thing, but, but most people, let's say in Southern California, are not close talkers. Like most people that I interact with on a daily basis in, in my lifetime, most people that I talk to, they're not a close talker. Question is when you do talk to, when you do interact with the close talkers, how do you respond? What's the, what's a, pro, a proper way to respond? Um, but every once in a while, I'll, I'll talk. When I had a neighbor, um, when I used to live in Orange, I had a neighbor who was who was a close talker, and it took me some getting used to. <laughs> and and I've and I've just talked to people over the years. Every every once in a great while, you you're, you're just like, whoa, this person's a close talker because you start you start backing up, you start moving away, and then they keep they keep coming after you basically. And and the question is, how do you respond? But anyways, watch that, enjoy it. Hopefully it makes you laugh a little bit. So uh, 31 is, is uh, talking about a theory called expectancy violations theory, EVT. So this theory is specific to nonverbal communication, specific to how we relate to our space, but specifically it's dealing with um, expectations that we all have for social behavior. So we all have expectations for social behavior. We have expe expectations for how people should, how people should respond, how people should communicate, and how people should behave in given contexts. It's all based on what's predicted to occur in, in certain types of social situations. Not, not necessarily what we want to, what, what we want to happen, but what we predict to happen. <clears throat> so if I'm in an elevator, if, if I walk in, an elevator and it's crowded, right? Um, the first thing I do, I walk in, what's the first thing I do? I typically turn around, right? A lot of people say like, first thing is you push the button. No, like imagine y'all are on an elevator, right? And I, and I step into the elevator. Well, if I didn't turn around and you're all in an elevator right now, and I'm just looking at all of you, that would be a violation of a social expectation, right? I'm violating what you ex expect or predict to occur. When someone walks into an elevator, your expectation is they walk in and they turn around and they face the doors. Now, obviously there's some elevators that have doors on both sides, like in a hospital, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like your standard elevator. So you expect me to, to step in, to turn around and then to push the floor that I'm going to. So if I don't, then a violation has occurred. And that can lead to either negative arousal or positive arousal. And that the, the term arousal is that, you know, you're, you're aware that, okay, this person's behavior is violating a social expectation. My expectation is that they turn around and they're not. And if I'm, if, if it's the elevator example, if I'm just looking at you and I'm staring at you and I'm making you feel awkward, that's a very negative violation, right? But imagine that you're on a crowded elevator and I step in and I don't turn around. And I'm just like hilarious, right? One of those people, I'm just, I, I start saying things, I'm telling jokes and I'm making everyone crack up, right? You might, you might say like, that's a positive violation. It's still a violation, right? We didn't, ex you didn't expect that to happen. So I, I violated your social expectation. I mean, I violated your expectation for my social behavior, but it was funny because you got to laugh and it pr provided some comic relief. Um, that's probably less common, but the point is, uh, a violation of an of a expectation for social behavior, it's not always negative. It could be positive. Um, and and what the way that we determine whether a violation is positive or negative, <clears throat> it's based on a variety of things. It's based on the person, the communicator, relation, there's a relational component, my relationship to the person, and then the context, of course. Um, and then the outcomes are like interpretations, decoding, social realities. Like, how do I how do I make sense out of this? How do I decode and and what's the social reality for this person violating the social behavior? So if I was at if I had a job interview, maybe you have a job. If I had a job interview and I'm wearing a suit and tie, it's a very formal job. Typically, I, I walk into the office. Right, there might be one or a few people, and I smile. I say hello. I give a handshake. Right, that would there are no violations there. But what if I walked into the office or what if I walked into the conference room for my for my job interview and instead of, of shaking hands and saying hi, hello, what if the person just just gave me a huge chug, right? My, my prospective employer, the person interviewing me, if, if let's say he or she says, hey, I, 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 I'm, I'm a hugger. I don't I don't just shake hands, but I'm a hugger. And they give me a great big hug and I'm wearing like, you know, it's all formal. I'm wearing a suit and tie. I'm looking around. I'm thinking, OK, I was not expecting that again. 
that might be a positive violation or negative violation. Now, the person who's giving me the hug, right, my potential uh, employer has the potential for giving very high rewards. Well, this person, if they hire me, high rewards, meaning I get the job, I get income, I have the potential to, to advance in the company and so on and so forth. Positive experience with the interview. I was okay with the fact, I just went along with the whole fact that they gave me a hug and it was weird, but uh, I went with it. And the, out, the, the end result is I actually had a great interview, right? The interview is great. The person is just really, really affectionate, really like engaging. And that's just how they, that's just how they are. So again, I might, I might not agree with that. I might think like, I don't like that, right? But it's, it's a violation of what I predicted to occur, but it was a positive violation in the long run. That's a very specific example, but I, I want you to understand the whole concept of um, expectations that we have for social behavior and how we respond to them. So if I'm, if I'm reacting positively or negatively to a person who exhibits behavior that's contrary to what I, to what I expect, the question is, why do I feel that way? Um, it, what about the person? What about the relationship I have with the person? What about the context itself is influencing my, my evaluation of the whole situation to be positive or negative? That's a lot to think about, but it's something that you engage in on a daily basis. And now you have a theory, a, a detailed theory to help you understand uh, how you feel and how you've responded in the past. And then of course, how to respond in the future. The codes and types of nonverbal communication. This is pretty straightforward. Pages 113 through 125. Um, body movements, kinesics, posture, gestures, how we how we use our body. It's all they're all different forms of communication, nonverbal communication. Facial expressions. Uh, I have a picture of a sad fish. Obviously, there's no connection to a sad fish, but sad fish is an acronym to help us understand the seven universal facial uh, facial expression of emotion: sadness, anger, disgust, fear, interest, surprise, and happiness. There's other um, versions of that of that acronym, but the, the point is, uh, among any culture across across most cultures, there are about six or seven universal facial expressions of emotion: sadness, anger, disgust, fear, interest, surprise, and happiness. In other words, anywhere you go in the world, you're probably going to find those facial expressions of emotion. They might look a little bit different. The way I express disgust here, let's say in Southern California, it might look different in another country and another culture. But the point is in that other country or culture, they have a, a universal, they, they have a facial expression that most people would understand as expressing disgust or interest or surprise. And then of course we have touch. We've talked about touch already. Ha uh, haptics is the city of touch. We have voice and we have vocalics is the study of all things relating to voice. Um, and then I have uh, a video here called the still face experiment. So watch this video on the still face experiment. This is showing, um, it, when you first watch it, 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 at one point you'll see the mom um, step away from the baby and she's just staring at the baby and the baby starts crying. It, it's a happy ending, so don't worry. So watch the video, take notes on this. The, the whole point of me showing you this is to illustrate that from, from the time that we're a baby, from the time that we're born, since from the time, um, from before we're born, when un, un, unborn children have an awareness, a unique awareness of their social environment, specifically um, people talking, people using tones of voice. I did that with my wife when she was pregnant with her kids. I would I would interact with with my unborn child while 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 my, my son was in her in her womb and when my daughter was in her womb, I would interact with them and I would feel like the reaction, right? I would say things and I would poke and I'd feel the, the poke back with either the foot, or the elbow or the leg. I really didn't know what it was, you know, because they're so little. But we have a unique awareness of our environment um, from the time that we're born, since, you know, or in my example, since before we're born. It's contrary to what people thought for a long time, that babies were just there, they didn't really know what was going on. So the point is humans are very aware of their environment in terms of nonverbal communication. Before they acquire before they acquire a formal language, before they can speak formally and fluently in let's say the English language, before they can do that, way before they can do that, they're highly aware of their environment through nonverbal channels. <clears throat> um, and of course, physical appearance, how we, how we dress ourselves, um, clothing, hair, makeup, uh, tattoos, piercings, the way we do our nails, jewelry, all, all those different things are, are different 
or different ways that we can express ourselves or different ways that we can communicate about ourselves through um, nonverbal channels. And sometimes when it comes to clothing, maybe you don't put a whole lot of thought into what you wear or you just, you know, you're wearing that because that's what someone got for you. But the point is it, it's a way, right? It's one channel of expressing who you are or expressing things, or maybe even having, um, showing support for a person or a sports team or that kind of thing. There's all different ways that we can express ourselves through physical appearance. And of course, our physical environment, the last one, um, our physical environment is something that we can, it's, it's related to proxemics, but, but we can, we can arrange our office as a professor. I don't have, a, I don't have, I'm not a full-time professor and I don't have an office that's always mine, but what you, you, you all, y'all have probably visited a professor who's been in the same office for, let's say five, 10, 15, 25 years. It's their office. They're there all the day, they're there every day. And some professors will st strategically decorate their office and organize their office to create a certain kind of feeling. Let's say the picture on the top right, if you have softer lighting and then comfortable couches, and maybe you even have um, certain pictures on the wall, and, and there's a variety of things that you can do to your to the physical environment to foster communication, to create a sense of peace and relaxation. Uh, Starbucks does it great, right? Starbucks is systematic in the way that they, they create a physical environment to, to make people want to stay there, to make people want to work on their laptops and do things and read. It's not random. <clears throat> if you've been into a Starbucks or another coffee place or any sort of like physical space where you're like, I just feel really comfortable here. And it feels like it's easy to talk to people when I'm sitting next to them versus it's, it's weird. It doesn't make sense. It's very difficult to talk to people. Um, the point is your, your, your physical environment, you can think of your physical environment as a code of nonverbal communication. Okay. So nonverbal communication is powerful. Actions speak louder than words and our nonverbal behaviors are generally a truer manifestation of how we feel. They're more authentic, right? When, if, if someone is, is talking to us in a certain way and it, and it sounds like they're um, if what they're saying doesn't really match up with, with their facial expressions or their, their nonverbal communication, we tend to go with their nonverbal communication. You're having a conversation with a friend and, and you're, you know, they seem like they're down, their facial expressions, maybe their posture, they're hunched over. They don't seem like they're in a great place, you know, and you, and you say, Hey, how's it going? And they're like, Oh, good. I'm, I'm great. Uh, yeah, all, all is well. And they're like looking down and they're like, I'm just tired. And you, maybe you know the person well enough to think like, I, I don't think they're just tired because everything about them says that they're not in a good space, that they're not feeling good, that there's something off. Um, you're probably right, right? If, if the person is just tired, maybe you would know. Like if, if, if it's something you know really, really well, you know whether or, not they're just, whether or not they're tired or if there's something else below the surface. And I'm not saying that you should pry in. and I'm not saying you should say, no, I think you're lying because your nonverbal behaviors suggest otherwise. But just know that oftentimes we tend to rely more, we give more meaning and we attach more value and meaning to the nonverbal behaviors than we do to the verbal. And they tend to be a more authentic um, manifestation of our, of our, <clears throat> of how we're truly feeling. First impressions, again, first impressions are powerful, but but we shouldn't put too much stock into them. There's a 7-Eleven rule. We've talked about that before. Within a short amount of time, we can we can uh, generate several impressions of a person through nonverbal communication channels. So the question is, how does nonverbal communication affect, how, do, how does nonverbal communication, how do nonverbal behaviors affect your communication? And, and the, the answer is they affect it greatly. And we are in control to a degree. It, it, oftentimes they're b below our level of consciousness. N certain nonverbal behaviors are below our level of consciousness. We might blush if we get embarrassed. I can't really control that. Or, um, you know, uncontrollable laughter. Sometimes I see a situation and it's so funny. And I know I'm, I might be, I might be using verbal communication to, to try to be serious, but below the surface, I, I'm about to bust up laughing because the situation is so funny. Um, but just know that, but, uh, just know that you you are to a large degree in control of, of how you use systematically your nonverbal behaviors to create certain kinds of situations. Okay, so that was a lot on two chapters of verbal communication, nonverbal communication. They're two different chapters, but they're highly interrelated. I hope you're all doing well, and I will talk to you later. Bye.